In America, blood means big business. It's this whole multi-billion dollar industry and there are centers all over the country. The North American blood market was valued at $3.3 billion in 2021. And America's blood makes up over 2% of U.S. exports. And since there is no substitute for human blood, demand can be hard to meet. You're at a one-day supply of blood right now? One-day supply of blood. There are still sporadic shortages. And that could have life or death consequences. This is a public health resource. It gives life. It's an amazing thing. But there are still hurdles for some groups. A historic FDA study that could reverse a ban on gay men who want to donate blood. The FDA's blood ban, it's not following the science. Griffles, CSL Plasma, Takeda's BioLife, and Octopharma are huge players in the blood collection space, particularly plasma. And donors are compensated. And that plasma can be used for therapies provided by big pharmaceutical companies. The collection of blood plasma for compensation is banned in most of the world. The U.S. supplies 70% of the world's plasma, creating this unique American blood economy. Got rewarded for donating, has kept me donating because I, I couldn't make it otherwise. I couldn't buy gas, I couldn't pay my, my car insurance. Here's how the weird economy of blood works and why the U.S. is such a major player. You either make what's called a whole blood donation, which takes about 30 minutes, where you give roughly a pint of blood. Plasma donation is quite different from a whole blood donation. Or you give what's called an apheresis unit, which is a little more extensive. You get hooked up to a, a similar machine. And this machine extracts blood and it separates the yellowish plasma component from the rest of the blood cells. And that's a, a greater time commitment. And then you get a cookie. One blood donation can be broken down into different components. That way, more than one patient can be treated. Look at this vial of blood. You'll see the red blood cells making up the bottom portion, a white layer in the middle, that's the white blood cells and platelets, and then the yellowish section, that's plasma, making up 55% of blood. And it transports nutrients, hormones, proteins, uh, to the parts of the body that need it. So due to its nutrient-rich properties, blood plasma is used in medicines to treat a range of medical conditions. The U.S. blood supply ran dangerously low over the pandemic. With a, the cancellation of elective surgeries, we suddenly had a surplus of blood. Then COVID caused cancellations of thousands of blood drives across the country. Plus, the baby boomers are aging out of the donor pool. We're not seeing younger generations pick up the slack, and we need them to very badly. As a millennial, it didn't make sense to just edit this story without going and donating blood myself. In order to qualify to be a blood donor, you have to be healthy. And then there are certain things that can defer someone from donating. You have to fill out an extensive donor history questionnaire, also making sure that your blood will be safe for the donor. So this is me. That you haven't had something in some exposures, some diseases, through has been a new blood test that should ensure that in future nobody contracts AIDS from a blood transfusion. So in 1983, when due to people contracting HIV from the U.S. blood supply, again, th this was back when there was very little known uh, about HIV, the FDA implemented a blanket ban and added a question to its blood donor questionnaire, have you had sex with another man since 1977? And if the answer to that question was yes, you were banned from donating blood. That's when the lifetime ban on these donors was implemented. In 2015, it was rolled back to a 12-month deferral. Then in 2020, when the pandemic struck, it was rolled back further to three months' time due to the urgent need for blood donors. A 2014 report found that allowing this community equal access to donating blood could increase the blood supply by 2% to 4% every year. Here we are 40 years later and there is still government policy that stigmatizes gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men and carries forward this false notion that there's something inherently diseased about being gay. There are 13 tests performed on each unit of donated blood, no matter who donated the blood. At the end of this month, my husband and I are going to be celebrating our, oh I have to get this right or I'm going to get in trouble, our 16th a wedding anniversary. Even though my husband and I choose not to have an open relationship, we can't donate blood. 
Uh, and and that that's just ridiculous. Outside of a medical facility, plasma is a product. Pharma companies use plasma to make treatments. Interestingly, nearly all of our plasma in the U.S. is sent to Europe, where the fractionators exist. So these fractionators will, will separate the plasma into its component parts and then sell it back to the U.S. and other parts of the world. In the U.S., it's legal to pay people for their blood. For, for someone who's 60 years old, I've got good veins. My, my name is Teresa and I live in Panama City Beach, Florida. I started donating my plasma because of my 80-year-old mother who had some blood issues. She, she passed away back in March, and I know she wasn't getting mine, but at least it helped the cause. I can make $650 to $700 a month extra, and, and that, that helps a lot when you're on a fixed income. There's also four major plasma companies that they run basically 80% of plasma donation centers in the United States. And they all stem from companies that aren't US-based. These are CSL Plasma, which is an Australian company, Griffles, which is a Spanish company, there's BioLife, that's owned by Takeda, which is a Japanese pharmaceutical company, and then there's Octopharma, which is a Swiss company. The profit margin is, is high, however, uh, that information is actually really hard to come by because it is a for-profit industry. Most companies didn't get back to CNBC or declined an interview. But CSL Plasma said it makes a substantial contribution to the economic and social well-being of our communities of interest. Plasma donation are advertising $900 for your first month giving plasma. Then it goes down. Usually people can make $30 to $50 each time they go. Centers tend to have different promotions. They have referral programs where they give you and the person you refer a bonus for coming in. They're really being creative with the strategies that they use to recruit people to become plasma donors. And once people become donors, then they, they really try and incentivize them to keep coming back. Clinics are increasingly set up in low-income communities. So what myself and colleagues have worked on is mapping out the location of plasma centers and seeing if there's a correlation between the address of the center and the poverty level of the area. And what we have found is that they are, in fact, overrepresented in high poverty areas. So both plasma donations and the number of centers have been on the rise. That's more money in donors' pockets, especially for those who depend on the extra income. Paso, Texas is the city where the majority of blood plasma is collected in the U.S. People cross the U.S.-Mexico border to sell their plasma and they would go back to Mexico. And if you did this regularly, you could actually make more money than the minimum wage that you would make working full time in, in Juarez. CSL Plasma said it selects sender locations based on population density, availability of real estate property, and local zoning laws. PPTA, a plasma industry group, told CNBC a significant amount of effort goes into planning. Companies consider feedback from local communities, access to a skilled workforce, public health data on the local population, and health is a key consideration to ensure the safest possible plasma. Americans can legally donate plasma twice a week, equaling 104 times a year. The impact of losing that much plasma on the body hasn't really been independently studied. But one small study of 64 participants found around 70% of donors experienced some health complications. They did something that impacts the body physiologically. I've heard of people who've said that they need to wait a little bit or they need to drink some liquids if they feel lightheaded, for instance. And they might feel woozy or fatigued or, or blackout. The only thing that I, I find is that sometimes I get tired and then I'll take a week's break. I drink lots of water, too. I've heard people that ha have had problems. So far, I have, and I'm, I'm 60. I'm, I'm trying to help and make some extra money at the same time. CSL Plasma told CNBC, plasma donors come from many socioeconomic groups. We work to ensure plasma donors have a positive, comfortable, and safe experience and are committed to the highest standards of quality and safety. Safety net is not adequate in the United States and people need to make ends meet. You know, people do what they have to do. There's the viewpoint that this is something that's exploitative, that these companies are coming into low-income neighborhoods and they're taking advantage of vulnerable populations. And then on the flip side, well, at least there's an opportunity here that's legal. It's one of the few legal ways that people could literally spend an hour and a half or so and make 50 bucks. That might make a really big difference in their lives.
the FDA has all the tools it needs at its disposal to lift the ban and uh, follow the lead of other nations like Italy and Spain and Great Britain and Australia. It's really a matter of uh, socio-political will. They are moving in the right direction. The FDA is now conducting a study, the Assessing Donor Variability and New Concepts in Eligibility, also known as the Advance Study, meant to investigate whether donor deferral can be based on individual risk assessment instead of the current broad time-based deferrals. And if the advanced study reaches its aim of enrolling enough men and can show that that blood is safe, then the FDA has the data, should have the data that will allow them to roll back the policy. I don't know what they'll roll it back to, um, but we hope that they will roll it back to individual risk-based assessment. What we're advocating for at GMHC is a shift from a blood donor questionnaire that screens people based on their identity to a blood donor history tool that screens people based on the behavior that they do that could place them at risk with exposure to HIV within that window period of time where the best available modern testing might miss that exposure in their blood. That should apply to everyone. And that's what will create the safest blood supply. Ochoa says that starting to look at the effect plasma donations have on the bodies of those donating would be a great place to start. In the United States, the FDA does regulate how often people can give plasma, but it's really not based on any particular research that has said, you know, you could give two times per week and it's safe. It really is more of an arbitrary number. If you go to Germany, for instance, is one of the other countries where you can collect blood plasma, uh, but it's about half the amount of times that you could collect in, from a single person you know, in the United States. And so I, I do think it's really important for researchers to investigate what the physiological impacts are. The FDA told CNBC that plasma donation is generally a safe procedure. The FDA first established standards for the frequency of plasma donation after careful consideration of available data on the safety of the donor and product quality and discussion with an advisory committee in 1973. If it's low income, if people of color who are giving their plasma more often, and these are already communities that are more prone to experience worse health outcomes, then are they really, you know, inadvertently debilitating their body by giving plasma because they're trying to make ends meet? Uh, there's really just, there's no way to answer those questions right now. The PPTA told CNBC, we strongly support legislation that would allow the coexistence of public and private plasma donation programs to encourage donation. This would increase plasma donation in the EU, thereby reducing the country's reliance on plasma from the U.S. and improving global access to life-saving therapies across the world to patients. Another thing that's worth mentioning is donor diversity. That is a very, very important thing because all of our red cells are a little different and it's a genetic thing. For instance, Black and African-American donors are usually the best match for patients with sickle cell disease. We really want to work hard to get younger donors out there and have a diverse donor base that mirrors the diversity in America. We need that very badly. And we need people to make blood donation a regular part of their lives. Let it be on their birthday every year or just find some way to turn it into a regular habit.